Hi, I'm Tom Stevenson, and welcome to Lecture 3A, Human Resource Management, APS 1004H. Uh, so I've broken uh, Lecture 3 into two uh, videos, 3A and 3B. So I'll shoot 3A first, and then there'll be a second one for uh, video 3B. So in 3A, we're going to uh, look at uh, one of the historical figures. Uh, as I said, we, I try to bring in different sort of historical figures so you can sort of get a sense of um, where some of the roots of uh, you know, our HR management uh, has uh, taken place. And then I mix that in with some more uh, current practices. And as you'll see in the motivational theory in lecture four, uh, more up-to-date current theorists so we can compare and contrast uh, a, a lot of what's in the roots of more historical theorists uh, has just evolved over time and then there's some uh, adjustments and new theories that have come out uh, as to what's the best format uh, to manage people lead people uh, etc in business so uh, in 3A, I'm going to bring up uh, Adam Smith in the first uh, few slides, and then we're going to look at consistent a consistency in HR and what does that have to do with uh, how people respond to it in a business environment. Uh, we'll talk about checklists and the value of checklists. I'll bring in a little bit more current uh, information, as I mentioned, uh, Atal Gawande and how he's... Uh, sort of uh, revolutionized how checklists are done in the medical field. And so we'll go from there. Okay, so uh, if you recall from lecture two, uh, we had uh, discussed the framework for the five categories that affect an HR system. Uh, we looked at the you know external environment, social, political, legal, economic environment, if that sounds a little uh, forgotten by you, you can go back and you can review lecture two. Um, to get a good sense of it. Most businesses have to sort of uh, look at what's going on in the external environment, have a grasp on how the external environment can impact them. Uh, business isn't large enough to change the external environment, so they have to be able to um, effectively work with it, respond to it, uh, work through strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats uh, that we mentioned in Lecture 2. We also talked about the workforce, um, the organization's uh, culture, you know, the demographics of the workforce, uh, background, experience, and uh, the organization's culture. And culture, we'll be kind of talking about the whole uh, time in this uh, particular course because culture is something that's important to a business and it can really sort of drive how the business uh, responds and acts to things. We talked about that when we, in lecture one, too, when we discussed uh, mission, vision, uh, core values and core values uh, sort of helping to drive what uh, decisions are made from a cultural perspective and how the culture is structured and set up um, also has an influence on that. The organization's strategy and uh, how it's going to implement its strategy, uh, some of the key aspects of uh, uh, how to uh, incorporate strategy into the overall business plan and how strategy and then tactics, the, the nuanced, um, detailed tasks of implementing the strategy, how that actually uh, works. And then we looked at the technology and production of uh, an organization of work. And that's going to be something that we talk about in our synchronous uh, sessions quite a bit, is um, some of the things that's going on right now because uh, the environment, uh, we're not physically in the office, or at least most people aren't physically in the office currently with uh, the pandemic. And uh, that's definitely going to have an impact on the technology production and the organization of work. And businesses have to have had to respond rapidly. And as we're out coming out of the pandemic at some point, uh, maybe when you watch this video, it'll be a different uh, group, uh, then how much of that stayed and how much we reverted back to the way things uh, were. I think there's going to be a lot more uh, adoption of some of the practices that have been learned uh, through this pandemic. Uh, at the same time, I don't think uh, we're going to necessarily throw the baby out with the bathwater, meaning that um, 
we're going to stop doing in-person meetings and all those kind of things once the pandemic has passed. I think uh, we'll definitely, that's important. That builds relationships in a lot of ways. Uh, so, but I, I think there'll be a lot more of the online interaction just because some, very often it can save a lot of time, especially if somebody's going to a meeting in another location and with traffic being what it is in the city, um, it can save a, a drastic amount of time. I'm noticing even with most people working from home, the traffic is still pretty bad uh, uh, in the city. So uh, technology of production organization of work. So uh, the first um, person that I just wanted to bring up in the first few slides uh, is Adam Smith. And for those of you that have not studied economics, uh, Adam Smith is kind of like the father of modern economics. Uh, he goes back to about the time when the United States was being formed. He's of Scottish descent, and um, he wrote a... Uh, book at the time, and it's free online, uh, called The Wealth of Nations. It's got a little bit of the old British uh, in the terminology if you sit down and read it. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of good uh, information in that, and there's a lot of information that's um, stood the test of time overall. Uh, so, you know, he, uh, he uh, brought to light the aspect of the benefits of free trade, uh, the concept of being an entrepreneur, a uh, big part of it is the division of labor aspect, which is important to us in this course, and we'll bring that up in different areas. The division of labor, it, he brought up this aspect of, uh, he has a pin example in his book, and it's um, really where uh, one worker could probably make only 20 pins per day, uh, while 10 workers divided up into specialities, doing something very specialized in the development of the pins, uh, could produce around 48,000 pins per day at that time. So, you know, the aspect of, well, one person doing everything from beginning to end is not the most productive or efficient way of doing things, and how it can be dramatically improved through the division of labor uh, he was probably the one that publicized that concept um, very early on. And this is at the early, 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 early infancy stages of the upcoming Industrial Revolution. Uh, so where things really um, got up to speed and really caused a lot of disruption during those time periods, uh, which we'll discuss a little bit when we talk about unionization coming up in a couple of classes. Uh, so yeah, he... Um, he thought uh, the division of labor was important, but it also when we start thinking about the division of labor, that's where you start thinking about management. How do we manage all of these people, coordinate it, and plan it and organize it uh, to be the most efficient and productive as possible? That's now where management starts to come into, the management as a science in its very early phases starts to come in as uh, a whole area of study uh, for people. So uh, one of the main points in the wealth of nation is the free market. Uh, so he, he also brought this concept of the invisible hand during the last financial crisis of 2008. Uh, if you listen to a lot of reports and things like that, there was this discussion of the invisible hand. The invisible hand is this matching of supply and demand. If you have too much supply uh, and not enough demand, then what's going to happen is um, over time, some of the producers will go bankrupt and fall out of the marketplace, and that will bring it down to more of an equilibrium so that we're not overproducing something. If there's more demand than supply, then new producers will enter the market, and then they'll start to produce uh, that quantity, and that will tend to lower the price. You can think of the first uh, Apple smartphone uh, that came out and you know with the touch screen and everything not all that long ago I, I guess around 2007 2008 and it didn't take it was it was flying off the shelves everybody was thrilled with this product it didn't take very long for the Samsung's and other uh, smartphone manufacturers to start producing a very 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 similar product um, so of course at a lower price point so that really kind of adjust things in the in the marketplace uh, so that's the the aspect of the invisible hands and there's a couple of quotes there on the side that you can see if a product 
shortage occurs, for instance, its price rises, creating a profit margin that uh, creates an incentive for others to enter production, eventually um, curing the shortage. If too many producers enter the market, the increased competition among manufacturers and increased supply would lower the price of the product to its production cost, known as the natural price. So just giving you a little bit of background about Adam Smith and his economics. Um, he also believed that while human motives are often selfishness and greed, um, the competition in the free market would tend to benefit society as a whole by keeping prices low, uh, while still building in an incentive for a wide variety of goods and services. Uh, Smith was suspicious of business people and argued against the formation of monopolies. So he wasn't totally laissez-faire free market. He didn't think it was a good idea uh, for uh, monopolies to be uh, getting a hold of things, but at the same time he wasn't a big uh, supporter of government intervention either. Um, so there had to be some uh, balance in there. And we struggle with some of these points today uh, where we talk about uh, you know greed and selfishness in the marketplace uh, and uh, the competition in the free market and free trade definitely a you know this he's going back to 1776 uh, but free trade is a very big issue uh, today and it's a very uh, discussed issue in politics and even recently uh, you know it's great that you can get things produced cheaper in a foreign country and then it's imported and that can benefit a lot of the users of goods but there can be downsides too especially if you get into uh, some political turmoil and different things like that with different governments that can um, also be potentially problem problematic in certain areas so in the wealth of nations where I really uh, drive Adam Smith in this course uh, it is in so this is his wording you have to realize it's 1776 so if it's a little bit uh, gender specific um, that's why uh, but his quote is is it is in the inherent interest of every man to live as much as his ease as he can and if his emoluments emoluments is pay so whatever he's being paid for doing the work um, emoluments are to be precisely the same, pay is precisely the same, whether he does or does not perform some very laborious duty to perform. It is as care it in it, sorry, uh, some of very laborious duty to perform it in as careless and slovenly a manner that authority will permit. So what that means is, if you're not adjusting your pay, you could expect that whoever the worker is, is going to look at what needs to be done and try to figure out what's the least he can do and still keep his job while receiving the pay. So slovenly is just meaning like a sloth, going very slowly, very sort of methodically, not really caring about the work uh, uh, that they're doing, minimizing. So I'd call, it, I'd call uh, that a minimalist, somebody who wants to do the very least that, that they deem necessary. Uh, I sometimes had a joke at uh, the college uh, with uh, certain students. They were very good at getting, what's the very minimum I need to pass and get my uh, diploma in all these courses, right? Uh, so Adam Smith's view was that people were like that. And the truth is this quote has been used a lot over the last uh, couple of centuries. Uh, probably uh, to its detriment, because I don't think that he actually meant it the way it's been interpreted, uh, but uh, industry as a whole, and we'll talk about this when we talk about motivation and extrinsic rewards, feels that if people have this carrot uh, in front of them, they're more likely to produce more. So, uh, and if they don't have it or it's minimal and it's not an incentive, then they won't have a motivation to do that. Of course, that's not always true, and we'll get into discussing that. That's definitely not always uh, true, but it definitely has some truth in it. So keep that in mind as we go through the course, when we talk about rewards, when we talk about incentives, when we talk about uh, trying to uh, motivate people in different ways. It's definitely a tool that is used by business, uh, but maybe some businesses think it's the only tool which <clears throat> they're missing some great opportunities if that's the only tool. 
So business management, uh, uh, so, yes. Uh, and so the division of labor uh, increased uh, requirements for human resource management. Uh, we can think of uh, human resources as having many definitions. I kind of like uh, this fairly simple one, achieving results through the effort of others. Uh, really simple. So really, how do we utilize the people that we have working for us to achieve the most results? Pretty simple, right? Uh, it's not so simple, though. It gets very complicated when we're talking about people. Uh, but definitely, if we want to um, be successful in managing human capital in the most efficient way possible, um, we want to be considering uh, that aspect of maximizing our results through their efforts. Uh, but as I said, sounds easier than it typically is. So when we think about uh, HR practices, uh, we can think about consistency and it, the role that it, it plays. And we can also think about how uh, businesses are organized as well. And keep in mind when I, I kind of say how a business is organized, generally it's, it's not all black or white. There's gray areas in the mix too. Things aren't always absolutes one way or the other. There's, there's some gray areas. Uh, but if we were to take one extreme, we could say the big happy family ideal uh, where uh, you get employment with a company and it's like lifetime employment. I don't think there really is lifetime employment that we can say for sure today in today's environment. Uh, the environment of the last 20 years, 25 years, it's definitely been going to more contracting out, more uh, short-term work. Uh, but definitely companies do want to typically retain employees for as long a period that makes sense where it's mutually benefit for both the employer and the employee. Definitely don't want to have a high churn rate where you're constantly training people. Um, so lifetime employment, extrinsic rewards de-emphasized. So money rewards, bonus incentives de-emphasized. I think a big happy family where people do chores and they don't always expect to have a, a bonus to their allowance, let's say. Pay differentials are minimized. Uh, so again, we're not having uh, the vice president or the CEO making a thousand times more than the lowest uh, level employee. There's definitely going to be a pay difference, but it's not magnet, magnet, uh, magnetized uh, or um, uh, maximized the way that you might think. And a uh, few status differentials. So it's not like that's the president. Oh, I can't talk to that. I got to go through my boss who goes through my boss who goes through their boss who go, you know, up through the different levels. A uh, lot flatter type of organization and less status between the different levels. Title isn't such a big different differentiating feature in a big happy family. Uh, not the reserved parking lot, the big corner office sort of deal. Um, Dog-eat-dog -dog philosophy is kind of the opposite. The emphasis is on extrinsic rewards. You're as good as what you just did. Uh, you compete against each other. Uh, you could think of uh, the banking sector uh, where you're private banking or Golden Sachs or something of that nature or where you're on commissions and sales. Those would be some example. Emphasis on extrinsic rewards. Uh, employment at will, don't produce, um, then uh, we'll find somebody else quick enough. Uh, compensation based on comparative performance. So really, uh, we'll talk about this later in the course, like General Electric had sort of a, a practice of um, they would rate rank people within the organization and the bottom 10% knew they were in the bottom 10%. The top 10% knew they were in the top 10%. And if you're in the bottom 10% and you didn't improve very quickly, uh, you were out of the com company. So constantly that bottom 10%, if you, a lot of pressure on people uh, to not uh, end up slowly going down there, which is hard when you're at the bottom 15% and they get rid of the bottom 10%, uh, it's hard. For, you have to be constantly pushing to improve. Uh, Status difference, differences are emphasized. You do have that parking spot. You do have that big office. You do have some of those perks. So that's a dog-eat-dog -dog philosophy. 
And again, some companies may have a little bit dog eat dog in certain departments, depending on the type of work that's being done. You know, if we're doing, uh, if we're doing uh, sales in one department, but in another department, it's more direct uh, accounting or something that, that's less measurable, uh, then in one area we may have bonus, extrinsic bonus incentives, while in the other area it's just a salaried employee. So in one area it could be very competitive, in the other area not as competitive. So that does go on as well if you're thinking, you know, it's got to be this or that. But usually there's kind of a, a, a bent that's one way or more the other way uh, with companies and how they act and how they respond. And that, of course, will affect the culture, right? Like uh, a culture in a big happy family is going to be quite different than uh, the culture in a dog-eat-dog -dog kind of uh, company. So question to think about, can both systems be su successful? And if so, why? I'll let you kind of ponder that. We'll bring that up when we're doing our class uh, synchronously. But uh, of course, you see both in being successful. I gave an example of a Goldman Sachs where you'd have uh, more of a dog-eat-dog. -dog. You could think of a big fa happy family uh, type uh, situation uh, probably fairly uh, readily. Um, but uh, definitely they are out there. So yeah, if you can come to class thinking of some of those uh, differences and comparatives and some real life examples, that's helpful for us to discuss. Uh, so uh, in the aspect of consistency, we're gonna look at uh, four questions. Why is it useful to be consistent dealing with HR practices? How can we measure consistency? Over what span should it be pursued and should it be related to the overall business strategy? And how does organizational behavior play into discussions of consistency in HR practices? So we're, we'll think about uh, these questions. So when we think about consistent HR practices, we can think about recruitment, compensation, performance appraisal, promotion, training. They should be consistent because you can imagine that if you have different levels of compensation based on how somebody feels or there's no real sort of rigor in it, people tend to find out what other people are getting paid. And then if somebody's getting paid more than they are and when they're not doing as much work or for the same job and the same type of work, uh, there will be uh, some jealousy. There will be people that will feel that they weren't treated properly a resentment. And that's not the best way to run a company that way. So that's a some of the reasons why you want to be consistent there. And we'll be looking at recruitment, compensation, performance, appraisal uh, in other classes that come up. Uh, employees should be treated consistently when compared to each other. Well, uh, there was an excellent uh, Friends episode years ago, and I think it was uh, uh, Jennifer Aniston. Uh, basically, she was... Uh, uh, working for this company and everybody smoked and she didn't smoke and so uh, everybody went out for break and with the boss and the boss was all buddy buddy with everybody that was smoking and then she was treated differently because she didn't smoke and so uh, she ended up trying to smoke just to fit in but um, treating uh, people consistently and with comparison to each other is important so you have to be very conscious of that uh, if you're treating uh, one person quite significantly different than another, uh, then they will take notice of that. So you want to try to be reasonably fair. It doesn't mean that you have to act exactly the same way to different people over certain things, because different people need certain adjustments to things. But definitely there needs to be a consistent element that's brought into that. Employees should be treated consistently when compared to time. This is a tough one because uh, how, how I how I'm treated yesterday sets the expectation to how I'm treated today and how I'm treated tomorrow. That's fine. Uh, but we also have to consider that the world changes very fast. We have a lot of technologies on the go and our businesses have to respond and be agile and be able to um, pivot when needed to be pivot, able to be pivot when, when required. So when we think about that, we do look for consistency. You know, if, uh, when I get paid, uh, how uh, our bonus structure is, uh, what the overall business strategy is, 
But at the same time, we have to accept that there's going to be changes that are going to come uh, our way and that we have to be able to adjust. So you have to keep that in mind. So when I say you should expect consistency over time, yes, on certain things, uh, how your boss acts and behaves. You know, if one, what you do uh, on Thursday is no good and on Friday it's good and on Monday it's okay, you don't know where you stand. So you have a certain expectation in your interactions with your peers and with your uh, uh, leaders, how that behavior is going to take place. Somebody that's more volatile up and down and all over the place, very difficult from an employee's perspective um, to provide them what, what they want, what they need, and when they need it. So consistency from that perspective is important. And if we think about how that uh, if, if that affects how we do business with suppliers, that how, uh, that's how if I've got if I'm a national company, how do I treat my client in Toronto should be somewhat similar to how I treat that same client in Vancouver. I've run in that a lot with people that I uh, companies that I work with and train. Uh, they want a certain level of consistency across the country because they have the same client and they're dealing with the same client. Uh, and the same people from the same client in Toronto and in Vancouver, but the people in Toronto and the people in Vancouver for this company are different. So you want to have a certain level of consistency so that client feels comfortable doing business with you across the board. So some reasons, single employee consistency, the employee will understand where they are at. You can imagine economies of scale. So if we're talking pay structures, recruitment, hiring, if we have certain processes and systems in place, that will dramatically help us. And so I think in the first class I talked about goals. Well, goals are very important. If we also have systems that allows us to repeat our successes in business, that's also very important. So. Having systems in place means we're going to have certain consistency in how we operate, hire, pay, recruit, retain employees. It makes it a lot easy to, easier to scale it up. If we, you know, looking at something simple, if you're a barista at Starbucks, they have training programs that are very consistent of what that person needs to do so they can ramp that person up to speed very, very quickly with very, very little effort. And that's important for a business like Starbucks. Seniority in the relationship of uh, cumulative knowledge through the experience and training. So those are some uh, benefits of uh, consistency. Uh, I also meant uh, investment in the training should mean increased selectiveness at the front end, retention strategies at the back end. If we are going to uh, be doing a fair bit of training, then we should also be fairly selective of the people that we bring in the front end and because that costs a lot of money, as you'll see when we talk about hiring in another class, uh, we should also have strat consistent strategies of, well, we just spent all this money recruiting this person. We don't want to turn them off the company and lose them. So do we have retention strategies uh, to keep these people on board? Uh, and uh, on the job training by senior employees is more likely to occur when there's a less competitive relationship. You can imagine we just talked about big happy family and dog eat dog. Well, one of the problems is if you're trying to onboard people and train people and get them up to speed, if it's a dog eat dog environment, my attitude is why do I want to show this person everything that I've learned over the last 20 years when they're going to steal my job? I'm not going to be so willing to give them uh, the proper training or help that would be required. So the company loses as a whole in those cases. So that, that's some of the disadvantages to the dog-eat-dog -dog environment, unless there's other incentives that are put in place that would make that person want to help the other person. Um, yeah, you can, even with consistencies within a, a company uh, and how uh, you uh, monitor things, uh, you know, does it, does how we are, watching over our employees does it make sense so you know if we have somebody that's a research scientist and we give them a lot of latitude in their work meaning that we're not micromanaging them they're not they're i got a lot of flexibility and then if we make them hit a time clock when they come in and when they leave that that's not really in alignment that's kind of uh, counterintuitive to the kind of 
job role that you've set up because likely that scientist is going to see the time clock and think, oh, okay, so that's the way it's going to be. I'm going to be here till nine and I'm going to leave at five. Uh, if the time clock's not there, they might come in at 9.15 or 9.30, but they also might leave at eight o'clock at night because they're into their work and they're doing it for intrinsic rewards, not just extrinsic rewards, which we'll talk about again in another class. Extrinsic being bonuses, intrinsic being for altruistic purpose. So uh, some of the reasons, psycho psychology of perception and cognition, keeping it simple and uh, through repetition of the learning process, more easily obtained and retained. If there are certain processes and systems that are in place, it makes it a lot easier uh, for people to do the mundane, low task ambiguity items. Uh, and e then that frees up time for them to focus on more high task ambiguity, more complex, difficult uh, tasks, if you will. And so that can be uh, helpful. When we think about uh, social forces uh, and consistency, we can think about uh, between the internal and the envi external environment, social norms that are going on. Is what you're doing here consistent with the external environment? We talked about the external environment, the political, the social, all of these things that are playing upon it from uh, outside the company. You can see a multinational company that it may be in sync with its home country, but now it's doing work in a foreign country. Is there some, they're trying to be consistent with how they are in the home country, but they, that might not be successful when they're going into another culture that has different expectations and social norms, norms of conduct of how people operate in that country. So there has to be some uh, consideration for the social forces for where the company is operating or the geographic location that that company is operating in. So, uh, you know, uh, a, an example of that uh, is uh, in the textbook I used to use, uh, they had, uh, they looked at some of the Jap Japanese auto manufacturers and very purposefully the Japanese auto manufacturers looked for uh, not, to, not to locate right in a big city or right in the suburbs of a big city, but further out, like maybe an hour out of a big city. Uh, so they wanted to be close proximity to a big city, but not crazy far, far out, but not too close. They wanted to be in like more of a town setting, a smaller town setting, because they wanted to emulate more of the big happy family aspect and less of the, you know, dog eat dog, go, go, go aspect. So that was a purposeful decision that they made. Uh, it used examples in the U.S. of where they uh, would do that. Uh, I think uh, a good example for us to look at in Toronto would probably be the Honda plant in Alliston. So Alliston's about an hour outside Toronto. Well, depending on traffic, it could be a lot more than that. Uh, but about an hour outside Toronto. And uh, it's a more smaller town kind of atmosphere. It's interesting because they're non-unionized. And so... Uh, because they're non-unionized too. That's also, we'll talk about less adversarial and some of the things that they had to go through to keep and retain being a non-unionized auto manufacturer in a very unionized sector. Not the easiest thing in the world to do, but it's definitely something that they uh, work hard towards because they want to kind of have that uh, big happy family kind of attitude in their business. Um, so, uh, Recruitment selection, matching of workers to the jobs. Uh, again, if you have consistency, that's a little bit easier to do. And um, employees, if you're hiring people, you can be pretty clear on what the positions are and how that role plays out. So that's also helpful for you to market and uh, sell to potential new recruits. And also that people are hired with the right expectations. Nothing worse than getting hired and everything is different than what you thought and it's not as good as what you thought, that can be pretty disappointing. So retention becomes an issue for those companies. 
among employee it kind of talked about that but definitely people do not like when others are treated better than they are for no good logical reason like my uh, friend's example that i gave earlier um, you know that person that's being treated better probably is quite happy but if there's four or five other people looking at that person's getting treated better than they are so you made one person happy and four or five other people dissatisfied i think you're at a net loss there so you have to be very cognizant about among employee consistency. It doesn't mean things have to be 100% the same, but there should be a consistent level of how treatment um, flows to an organization. And that can be with demographical groups, that can be with gender, uh, race, that can be you know right across the board, pay structures, um, age, uh, all of these things, uh, that definitely is an important aspect. And any kind of viable com company in North America that's thinking properly is thinking about trying to have among employee consistency in these areas because the benefits um, can be quite great or quite negative if they're not following that. So there is this, uh, in the, the book I used to use, it, it used to mention this checklist that can be um, uh, taken uh, so just to really sort of understand how an organization is and how it fits and then from a perspective of an employee or an employer or from a supplier uh, what you've learned by answering these questions really so you can ask you know does the organization presume trust or distrust in relations between the firm and its employees so is it fairly transparent or not does it presume trust or not so uh, you know if you have a time clock and you're being uh, monitored with video cameras everywhere uh, probably you could say well no they don't really trust us they're taking a, a position of distrust so these that, that would be just answering that particular question uh, on the other hand if it's pretty transparent uh, and uh, the information is is free flowing then that would be uh, trying to come across as being more trustworthy does it assume an inherent desire to do good work or an inherent tendency for employees to shirk unless they are motivated and controlled by incentives? Sort of the Adam Smith slovenly aspect that I mentioned earlier. Is the emphasis on egalitarianism or meritocracy? So egalitarianism is where everybody's treated equal, Merit, uh, like as far as pay. So it's, you don't have extrinsic bonus incentives. Meritocracy, you have bonus incentives, extrinsic reward. Uh, that's more the dog-eat-dog -dog style, but again, there can be extremes. In other words, is everyone treated equally or merit and competition? Uh, centralization, where, does, where are the decisions made? Are they made in, from head office in Detroit, Michigan, or are they decentralized so the Toronto office gets to um, sort of make its own decisions? Or is everything going to be vetted through uh, some other department or centralized location? So whether you're decentralized or centralized. Uh, openness or secrecy. Uh, a good company to, a very interesting company uh, to look at, I think, uh, is a company called Bridgewater. Uh, Bridgewater is a company that a person called Ray Dalio started. He wrote a book called Principles, uh, I guess about two or three years ago now. Uh, you, can, you can check YouTube videos. Ray Dalio's pretty, um, pretty out there. Uh, and uh, they're, they're, they've been uh, the most successful hedge fund company in the world. Uh, I think they've had a little bit of a rough six months right now, but uh, overall they've been one of the most successful, if not the most successful hedge fund companies in the world, handling billions and billions of dollars of capital. And their company actually op operates in a very uh, open and transparent way. Uh, such that uh, anybody can call out anybody if they feel that they're not being straightforward or honest, uh, even the CEO, uh, and it's not taken to be personal, it's taken to be trying to help the company to be better as a whole. And uh, Dalios uh, felt that you know when people are not honest with each other, uh, then you're missing opportunities because you're not willing to speak up when you see something that's not right. These items can be debated and corrected. Everything is taped for everybody to see. Uh, so there's very, very little secrecy, a lot of openness in that company. Very, very little that's um, not um, widely available. I think he said it's only 
um, kept uh, under wraps if it's some personal information about an employee that uh, shouldn't be legally let out or a client or that sort of thing. Other, th other than that, it's pretty much an open uh, door policy. Uh, competition or cooperation. So that'd be the dog eat dog or versus the uh, ha big happy family. And is it a company in a business sector that has some stability or is it a company that's in flux and change? Uh, today's market, there, you know, there are companies that uh, there's been a certain amount more stability. You know, you take a construction business. Uh, traditionally, they've uh, been more slow to change and evolve. I think they're on the precipice of massive change with building information and modeling and things uh, really sort of uh, ramping up how things are done. But at the same time, compared to a lot of industries, it's been more of a slow progression uh, compared to, say, manufacturing or um, IT or Silicon Valley startups, these kind of things. So uh, is it a very traditional business or is it one where you've got stability or is it in flux and change? That's going to have that's a good thing to ask yourself about a business sector. It's a good thing to ask yourself about a sector that you're studying to uh, get into. You know, how much of this can be outsourced to another country? How much can technology take over? Uh, is it uh, um, successfully or is it is it uh, complex enough uh, that it's not going to be easily uh taken over by AI, et cetera. So you kind of want to look at these things and the, what's the time horizon on it uh, to consider how change might impact these industries. Even though nobody has a crystal ball, I think it's, um, I think it's uh, to your benefit uh, to consider those things. Is the focus on individuals or groups? Uh, we mentioned uh, that, sort of the big happy family or dog eat dog, or is it also really group? oriented collaboration no one person can do all the work uh, that would give you a good indication construction field would be a good example of group work perhaps uh, sales uh, might be a more individual uh, particular type of job is the emphasis primarily on outcomes or process following the rules uh, is the organization's view primarily as an economic entity devoted to making shareholder money for the shareholders or is it more for an altruistic uh, purpose? And is the job more about jobs or careers or uh, really a calling for people? So you can think about that. Some people go to work in a place and it's just a job and they just go, they do their thing for the eight hours. For others, it's a career. They want to get better at it. They're, they, they see themselves as working on a path to mastery of becoming the best they can in that particular area and then it's becoming bridging from being a career to a calling for that individual. Uh, so really does the organization offer jobs or careers? Are people stuck in the same job with very little opportunity to advance? We'll talk about that later in the course called an internal labor market where you've structured where you're trying to entice people to want to move up the corporate ladder, uh, move, learn new positions so to speak. Some companies are really adept at that and other companies, eh, not so much. This little section here uh, refers to, because uh, I just said this can help you to sort of identify like a checklist, uh, some of the benefits of a particular business, these past few bullets. Uh, I think about when I, I think about checklists and we talk about systems and processes, there's a lot of value to checklists. And we talked about tools and techniques and mental models when I was starting this uh, course with you. And I think there's a lot of value to be had uh, with understanding how you can utilize checklists to better improve your systems, your processes, uh, so that you don't leave things out, so that you ask certain questions, so that the simple stuff doesn't get lost in the shuffle. And there's an excellent book written. It's called The Checklist Manifesto. I think I've got it here on the shelf. Let me just check. It's called The Checklist uh, Manifesto. It's written by a doctor called Atal Gawande. He's written a number of books. Uh, very, very 
um, well-written author. Uh, I think you can even see online, The New Yorker, I believe, has available online uh, one of his articles on checklists. But this book was excellent. Uh, really, what Atal did was, uh, he's a surgeon, and in the book he talks about uh, how in the 1950s there was just as many mistakes in surgery as uh, today, and going back about 10 years. And he uh, noted that, and he wondered, how is it that we haven't improved and we still have these uh, mistakes and errors in surgeries? And these were quite significant errors where people die. Uh, just because forgetting to do something. He gave some examples, like if you don't give the uh, antibiotic injection at a certain time, then it won't have full effect during the surgery, and then the person can get infected, and a whole bunch of examples like that. And usually these are, are things that just got missed. So what he actually, uh, he walked outside the hospital, and the hospital was getting a big addition put onto it at the time, and he went into the construction trailer, and he saw a big schedule on the wall, and he, he started talking to the project manager, and the project manager said, well, this is like our checklist for the project. These are all the things that we do. We have submittal logs, we have inspection logs, we have these different checklists that we utilize uh, so that we don't miss things during inspections. And he started thinking, hmm, why don't we do things like that more in surgery? And he started looking into the background. You can sort of see in the fine print I've got on the slide, there's very, very few major construction failures. We have lots of rework, believe me, and lots of waste in construction, but major significant structural failures um, are quite rare. Uh, when you hear about them, they're widely publicized. I think in the last year there was a bridge that went down in Florida and there was one in Italy, very highly publicized in all the news. But when you consider the whole world, that's not a lot of bridges. Uh, so very, very few of them going down, uh, very, very few uh, severe uh, um, kind of error rates compared to what they were getting in surgery anyways. Uh, he's got a stat down there that you can sort of see a lot of zeros um, uh, in front of the decimal point. So he also looked at uh, the uh, aeronautics, right, and aviation the safest way to fly. I know we've had uh, some issues with uh, the Boeing 737 uh, over the last year, and I was going to fly to Edmonton. I was on just about to get on one when they canceled it, uh, and they grounded them. Uh, they uh, are Flying is the safest way to go. That's probably one of the reasons it is, because when something happens, there's a full investigation, and then there's really like trying to get at the bottom of it to make sure it doesn't happen again. They were a little bit slow on that one that there was two planes that went down, but really how many cars get in accidents before something really gets looked into closely like that? So you think about uh, checklists and uh, flying. Pilots have checklists. Pilots have checklists before they take off. Pilots have checklists if something goes wrong, things that they go through to make sure that uh, they're not missing something in their evaluation to speed up the process. Uh, so really, those types of things assist in limiting the amount of mistakes that are made. And, you know, as a manager, if you're, if you're doing some process that's fairly frequent, hiring a new staff person, you could have your own checklist of things that you want to go through and vet. And you can develop that, you can uh, correct that, you can adjust it over time, and it can be very, very, very helpful to you. Even myself, I do a lot of uh, consulting work, as I may have mentioned, but myself, even just on uh, on myself, I just have a whole list of items that I have for checklists on my iPad because they're very easy uh, to do when I'm doing a presentation and there's things I need to do. I have time periods where I should be on which slide and I check it off so I can keep track of where I should be on uh, various days of doing the, the work. Um, so it doesn't take long to put together a checklist and it's very easy to uh, follow and uh, keep up and then it just, I empty, I dump that stuff out of my head and it makes it easier for me to then deal with the more complex things. I'm not always thinking about where should I be, where should I be? I can see, oh, okay, I'm a few minutes behind, I'll just speed it up or I'll skip this slide and I can move on 
And that's very, very helpful as opposed to being in reactive mode with things. It helps you to be more proactive, uh, less reactive, and less likely to miss things. So hopefully that's given you a good sense of how a uh, checklist can be used. I would encourage you to take a look at that New Yorker article if you if you can. Google Atal Gawande. I'm sure he's got a lot of YouTube videos and different things that he's done over the, the years as well. Uh, as I said, he's written a number of books, but the Checklist Manifesto was really, really a renowned one. Because what he did was he didn't just sort of see the value of checklists. Then what he did was he worked with uh, the World Health Organization to implement checklists in surgeries and they've implemented it in surgeries all over the world I think including Princess Margaret Hospital uh, hundreds and hundreds of hospitals have implemented it and they've measured it so Peter Drucker if you can't measure it you can't manage it they measured the difference between having the checklist and not having the checklist in the hospitals that it was implemented in and there was a, over a 50 percent improvement uh, they lowered the death rate due to errors in those hospitals by 50%. That is a large number when we're talking about the difference between life and death. Um, so very interesting story, and it is a very good tool, I think, for managers to use. Helps with consistency, too. We're talking about consistency. It's a good way of making sure that you're following consistent processes and that you're not missing uh, certain parts of the puzzle. So hopefully uh, uh, that comes uh, through okay. I think what we're going to do now is we're going to take a break and I'll have a second video, which will be Lecture 3B. And we'll look at employment and economics, expectations, balance of power, and long-term relationships, sort of wrapping ourselves around these uh, topics with what we just talked about. So have a wonderful day, and we'll see you for the next part when you're ready.